Good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing this morning? Uh, so just want to call to order this um, interim committee on uh, wildfires. Um, as always, be sure when you are not speaking to um, mute your microphone. And with that, I will let Mr. Sinisbeck uh, take the uh, role today. Thank you, Chair. Senator Gorgachia? Here. Assemblywoman Peters? Here. Assemblywoman Titus? Here. Assemblywoman Titus? Senator uh, Brooks? Are you able to hear that? Here. Yes, ma'am. Senator Scheibel? Here. Mr. Raby? Here. And Chair Clank. Here, thank you so much. Um, so with that, um, we have, this is our fourth and final meeting of um, the interim study on wildfires. Um, we will be, um, I'm sure that None of us had expected to really do this all virtually. It had kind of expected to all be in the same room. We have a lot of more conversations that way usually, but um, I hope that this has been helpful and that we've been able to um, make some progress um, on understanding the problems we have here in Nevada. As we've seen so over the last couple of weeks, we've had several fires um, and um, Hopefully, as we move through today's agenda, we have two presentations and then we'll move into the work session um, that some of the, the BDRs that are brought forward in the next legislative session will help make some progress on our, on our welfare issues here in Nevada. Um, so just a couple housekeeping um, uh, remarks before we get started. So minutes of the meeting are produced in the summary format and not verbatim. Um, materials, all these meeting materials can be accessed on the committee's webpage. And anyone who would like to see, receive electronic notification and access to the committee's agendas, minutes, and final report can do so by signing up on the Nevada Legislature's website. Um, the committee will be taking actions, taking action on agenda items today, and we will use a roll call vote to do so. Um, there will be a public comment period at the beginning and at the end of the meeting uh, with public comment limited to three minutes per speaker. Um, and just so that everyone knows how to do this in this virtual format, um, there's a lot of different ways and I'm just going to read through these just in case uh, folks are watching online and don't know how to call in um, or submit comments. So if you want to call in for public comment, you call the number 669 nine zero zero six eight three three and then you enter meeting id nine three one three two five seven two six one one you can also email comments into wildfires at lcb.state.nv.us um, and you can also if you have a fax machine um, and know what one is, you can uh, fax in your comments to 775-684-6600. So with that, um, we will move on to the rest of our agenda. And um, uh, do we have anyone waiting for public comment? Yes, Madam Chair, would you like to proceed with public comment? Yeah, so with public comment, as I said, you'll give, be given three minutes to speak um, and the staff will notify the speakers when the 30 seconds remain and when the time is up. And just remember, too, that there will be um, additional time to make public comment at the end of the meeting. And public comment will be run by the broadcast and production services staff and will interact with folks who are making public comment and providing um, testimony. Um, so with that, uh, we can move into public comment. All right, caller with the last three of 249, please state and spell your name for the record. You have three minutes. You're now unmuted and may begin. Hi, this is Ernie Adler. I'm going to wait for the agenda item to make my comments. Do you hear me? Hello? Yes, sir. Now, uh, now is the time for public comment, um, either now or at the end of the meeting. I'd like to make my comments during the agenda item.
Um, Mr. Adler, I believe that um, there won't be time, there won't be a space for, for comments at that point. Uh, we're doing it for public comment at the beginning at the end, I believe. Is that correct, Mr. Stenisbeck? Well, I was going to make the uh, comment upon the our, uh, my recommendation on coordination between Sierra Pacific Power and Liberty Utilities at Lake Tahoe. Um, I observed that they uh, both have detailed fire mitigation plans, but I think they need to be coordinated so that they can work together. Otherwise, we may have a problem if we have a major fire up at Tahoe where the efforts aren't coordinated. That's that's my comment. Okay, we can move on to the next caller of 590. Please state and spell your name for the record. You have three minutes. You are now unmuted and may begin. Madam Chair and members of the committee, my name is Adam Watts. I'd like to recognize the Wildland Fire Week of Remembrance from June 30th to July 6th which was established following the Yarnell Hill fire that claimed the lives of 19 Granite Mountain hotshots in Arizona in 2013. In Wildland Fire, this week is dedicated to all those who have fallen in the line of duty and is intended to serve as an opportunity to renew our commitment to the health, wellness, and safety of wildland firefighters. As a former volunteer and fourth generation firefighter, I'd like to offer appreciation for the work this committee is doing to work towards advancements in resource protection public benefit, and the safety and health of our wildland firefighters. Thank you. And Madam Chair, that concludes public comment at this time. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, I believe with that, we'll move on to our next agenda item, which is the approval of minutes for the meeting on June 2nd of 2020. Um, I, all members had access to the draft minutes, uh, which are posted on the committee's webpage. Um, so with that, I'll take a motion to approve the minutes from Assemblywoman Peters and a second from Senator Brooks. Um, and with that, Mr. Stenisbeck, will you take, oh, is there any discussion? Sorry, I almost forgot that part. I always almost forget that part. Um, with that, Mr. Stenisbeck, please take the roll call vote. Senator Brooks? Yes. Senator Gorgachia? Yes. Senator Scheibel? Yes. Senator Owen Peters? Yes. Chair Swank? Yes. Senator Owen Titus? Yes. Thank you. The motion passes. Thank you so much. So with that then, let's move on to, we have two agenda items for presentation before we get to the work session. Uh, the first is um, a discussion of using conservation science to aid wildfire management. Um, and we have some folks with the Nature Conservancy here with us. I believe it's, um, and I'm not sure to pronounce your last name, sir, uh, Dr. Uh, Proventure, with, who's the Director of Conservation Ecology, and Mickey Hazelwood, who's the Eastern Sierra Nevada Program Director. Um, so welcome, and uh, please proceed. For the record, I'm Mickey Hazelwood, Eastern Sierra Nevada Program Director for the Nature Conservancy. And first, um, my colleagues and I would like to thank Chairwoman Swank and each member of this committee uh, for the opportunity to present to you today. Uh, we sincerely appreciate and respect your time. Uh, as Chairwoman Swank just said, today we're going to be discussing some of the ways the Nature Conservancy is using conservation science to aid in wildlife, uh, wildfire management. Uh, in case you didn't know, the Nature Conservancy is not only a science-based organization, we're also practitioners of many of the restoration actions that we, uh, we model and, and recommend. And the picture in this slide is from a prescribed fire that the Nature Conservancy planned and managed at our Independence Lake Preserve. 
The Nature Conservancy's mission is to conserve the lands and waters on which all life depends. And here in Nevada, our conservation work falls into five different programs. Three of those are geographically based, the sagebrush ecosystems, Eastern Sierra Nevada, and Mojave Desert. Uh, the other two conservation programs are cross-cutting and can touch down in one or more of these geographies. Those are our water program and climate action programs. As we move through this presentation today, uh, we're going to focus on some key takeaway messages. One, restoration increases ecosystem resistance to wildfire and to a lesser but still meaningful degree can increase um, landscape resilience post wildfire. Fuel breaks are an important tool in our toolbox for wildfire management and we can only view those as part of the solution. Fuels management in our forests and shrublands are a key element in watershed management and those actions can enhance water security for people and nature. Finally, restoration and fuels management are natural climate solutions. Uh, as already mentioned, uh, these actions can enhance water security and among the other multiple benefits, uh, they can also enhance carbon storage. So with that introduction to the presentation, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague who's going to discuss uh, some of the tools that we employ in addressing these issues. For the record, my name is Louis Pravashi. I'm the Director of Conservation Ecology for the uh, Nature Conservancy in Nevada. We're gonna talk about fuel breaks. You see a photo here from a helicopter in the Hawaii uplands. Uh, we, we're gonna study, we study these with connectivity models to effectively cite fuel breaks. We're gonna come back to this. We're also gonna talk about landscape conservation forecasting, a method we developed in the Nevada chapter to help plan management. You see a photo of the United States here. The stars are places where we've applied this method. Next slide, please. The first study was funded by the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, and we were asked to cite fuel breaks strategically to protect greater sage grouse habitat. On the left, you, um, you see a a photo that's part of this greater landscape that was 23 million acres. It was the Hawaii uplands. So it's Nevada, Oregon, Idaho, and Utah, this kind of central area that's called the Hawaii uplands. And out of this 23 something million acres, uh, here's a little snapshot of probably something that, let's say a thousand acres out of the whole thing. And what we did is that we use these connectivity models to determine the most likely path of fire would spread. So if fire starts from point A, what is the probability or the likelihood it will get to point B somewhere else in this vast landscape? And red are areas that are very prone because of vegetation, topography, and prevailing winds to actually transmit fire. So the fires will just rip through that. The blue areas are less likely. And we said, let's find all these areas in these greater geography and find roads and put green strips or fuel breaks, basically fuel breaks that will absorb part of that fire. Not perfectly, but we'll do some of it. On the right, you have the same picture, but we found this road and we put a fuel break and we modeled this. This is model. And we did this for approximately 13 areas in the greater Hawaii uplands that were significant to us because they were upwind of greater sage grouse important areas and what you see is that the fuel break will actually stop some fire it's not perfect but they can fires can jump fuel breaks but when we did this systematically across the landscape what happened is that we we cool the fire activity throughout the 23 million acre landscape and it did end up protecting sage grouse legs but remember this is this is model world next slide please we're gonna to shift to landscape conservation forecasting. It was developed by our chapter and basically can be summarized by maps, models, and metrics. We use two kinds of maps on the left. First map is ecological system. So you pick any one location on this map and you'll determine, we determine through remote sensing that we do ourselves, whether it's Wyoming sagebrush, Jeffrey Pine, mountain sagebrush, a riparian system. 
And you take that same exact location, you pick your favorite map pixels. You know, this is from satellite imagery that we interpreted. And you go to the lower map, you go at the same exact location, and that will tell you what is your condition right there? What is the vegetation that you have? So in the upper map, you may have said, this is Wyoming sagebrush, but the lower map will tell you, well, this is all dominated by cheatgrass. Or it's a shrubland, Wyoming sagebrush again, that's all encroached by pinyon and juniper. Or it's a nice Jeffrey Pine system in perfectly good condition. So we need these two maps to tell that story. And with that information, we create models. So if there's 25 distinct ecological systems in this landscape, we will have 25 of these state and transition simulation models. Some are bigger, some are smaller. But this information of the maps populates those models. And the beauty of these models is that we can simulate them on a computer into the future, 25, 60 years into the future, with fire and bug kill and management activities and all that. And we design what we call what-if scenarios. What if scenarios are basically similar in NEPA to propose actions? But what if scenarios could be, I'm not going to do anything else than what I've been doing before, or I'm going to do aggressive fuel breaks, or I'm going to do aggressive restoration. So you can dream up these scenarios and with a budget and failure rates and success rates and all that and fire and droughts. And we simulate into the future. And from that, we're going to ask, well, are we better off doing something active and paying for it? compared to doing nothing and not paying for it? Uh, or are we, is there differences between these active scenarios? And to do that, we use metrics. And on the upper panel there, you see all these colors. There's each ecological system has a scorecard. That's our baseline metric that we provide for all our projects. And red is bad, green is good, and yellow is intermediate. And basically it says you can determine the scorecard, the value and percentages of your ecological system. What is the health of the system? Currently, and if you simulate in the future, you can say, what is it in the future after I've done all this stuff? And basically, you get a scorecard of your progress. Some of our customers or partners we work with want different metrics. And for this project, we were asked by the BLM to do greater sage grouse habitat suitability after 30 years of active management. So in this map of greater sage grouse, that's the map in the lower part on the right, Green is good, red is bad, yellow is intermediate. And basically, uh, it just tells you, if you do this with management, you get this map. Had we done another map, which I can't put in this slide, for doing nothing extraordinary or just no management, no, no management, we could compare the two maps, and we've done that. Next slide, please. So in the framework of landscape conservation forecasting, we actually did a, a simple scenario where we had several objectives. And here are the two management actions we designed in this. One is we took this landscape in the Hawaii uplands. This is the Hawaii allotment. And uh, for those of you who know this landscape, the Martin fire went through the southern part of this landscape. This work was done prior to the Martin fire. You'll see on the left a slide called a panel there called fuel breaks. And what we did, we took existing roads. We didn't punch through intact vegetation. We took existing roads and we buffer them from a fuel break when we assign a certain resistance to fire going through them or jumping through them. The second action that you see on the right, we actually uh, seeded. And all those dark blue areas are areas of greater concentration of cheatgrass, and we seeded their perennial grass. So we change, we're trying to change the fire behavior from something that's very flammable, something that's a whole lot less flammable. So for a point of reference, this landscape here is about that you're looking at with those fuel breaks about 200,000 acres I don't know the exact number but some of those linear fuel breaks you see there are like 30 miles long so they, they they're pretty big so these are the two actions and we're going to slice and dice them to do management scenarios next slide please what did we find so the first result is is maps of fire so there's three panels here, and this is a heat map. Each pixel on this map, each location on this map, the color tells you how often that area burned. The warmer, the redder the color, the more often that location burned over and over and over again over a 30-year simulation. Gray areas never burn, and blue areas probably burn once, maybe twice. So it gives you an idea of the fire activity. And what you notice on the left, it says no management scenario there. That's a scenario. And there's this red area 
that uh, and yellow area that in the red circle that burned. And it burned quite frequently. There's a little bit of activity in the north that happened too. The middle panel is called fuel breaks, where we took those fuel breaks I just showed you and we put them in the landscape and we ran the simulation again with fire spreading and all that. And you'll notice two things is that the fire activity changed a little bit in shape, but there's still quite a bit of fire in that red circle. So we didn't affect there. And you, if you remember that previous slide, we didn't really have fuel breaks in that area. There's not, it was not convenient to put one. But what you do notice is that the fuel breaks have local effects where they sometimes have this sharp line that can stop fire. So you see a road there, a fuel break, and there's no fire on the other side. So that was a success rate. What's interesting to us is the right panel where we actually added restoration. We kept the fuel breaks, but what's really the benefit here is from fuel breaks where we seeded perennial grass in these cheatgrass dominated areas. And what you'll notice is that we cooled greatly the fire activity. There's a whole lot less fire. That is due not to the fuel break, it's due to the seeding of perennial grass replacing cheatgrass. That's basically what it is. Next slide, please. We can express that same kind of data as a graph. So in this graph here, you have on the x-axis years of simulation. So if you see on the right, it says it's 25 at the bottom there in time step. That means that the simulation was run for 25 years in this case. On the y-axis, you see the acres that burn. Now the golden bar is no action. So the golden bar in this graph, for every year calendar, there's a golden bar and then there's a dark gray bar. The dark gray bar is management, and that is a seeding combined with the fuel break. Now, I just have to tell you, we could have put a third bar for every year, make it more complicated, and that would have been the fuel break alone. But the fuel break alone was not very different from the no action in terms of total amount of fire. So what we're seeing is really the effect of seeding, and that's the gold bar compared to the gray bar. And what you'll notice is that consistently, when you do management, you reduce the acres burn. And that's the message out of this. Management pays off to reducing fire activity, and that mostly from restoration of cheatgrass dominated areas. Next slide, please. This is a little more complicated. I'll walk you through it. This has to do with net primary productivity. So in the y-axis, we have the years of the simulation. And then net primary productivity on the, axis, in the, on the y-axis in terms of pounds per acre, that is simply the amount of vegetation carbon that's stored in the stems, the leaves, and the roots. So it's all the carbon and vegetation you can cram in a system. What you'll notice is that there's a red and green line. Red is minimum management. Green line is the fuel break. So in this slide, we're actually showing again the fuel break. And what you'll notice is not a big difference between the red and the green line. They're actually statistically not different from one another in terms of how much carbon you're storing in this system. But the blue line, which combines the fuel break and the seeding, and really what you're seeding is the effect of the seeding right here. Well, in this case, there's more carbon increasingly stored so that the, as time goes by, there's actually progressively more carbon, and these differences are significant. So seedings alone stored more carbon into this system, and that's what it shows. Next slide, please. People don't like pounds per acre of carbon, so we converted our metrics here to barrels of oil. So people can relate to a barrel of oil standing there on asphalt. You can actually see that in your mind. This slide here shows the difference between doing nothing, the minimum management the minimum management scenario, and basically doing the seeding with the fuel break. And basically what we're talking about here is the seeding effect. Now, I'm gonna walk you through this. On the very right, it says total ecosystem carbon, and it says 88,000 something. That is, if you were to do nothing and let fires just rip through this landscape, 88,000 barrels of oils would just vaporize into the atmosphere. You're just spewing carbon, 88,000 barrels of oil worth of carbon to the atmosphere. Now, if you look at that red circle, you'll see soil. And what you'll notice, is, and this is specific to rangeland, not forest, is that 70% of the carbon that's stored in rangeland goes into the soil because of the fine roots of perennial vegetation, especially grasses. So if you do no management action, basically 61,000 plus barrels of oil go spewing in the atmosphere. However, should you want to do management, you can actually store that 88,000 and the 61,000 into the soil. 
The beauty of soil carbon, it's a very form, stable form of carbon. Once it's in the soil, it stays there. It will stay there for a long time, regardless of the fires on the top. So that's a real benefit. And I think after this, I pass it back on to Mickey. So as Louis has demonstrated, restoration is a, a crucial component of wildfire management. And knowing that, it's important to discuss the challenges of restoring sagebrush communities. Unfortunately, a lot of our post-fire restoration efforts are unsuccessful at establishing uh, the desired plants. And even when we are successful at restoring elements of, um, of those communities, uh, we rarely return the full value of the resources we've lost, um, particularly in terms of habitat and habitat values. So to address these challenges, Nature Conservancy takes the same approach as many other, um, many others in this field. We need to get the right seed in the right place at the right time. And to that end, here in Nevada, we're working with the Nevada Native Seed Partnership to increase uh, the availability of locally grown, locally adapted native seeds for use in restoration efforts. We're also working with partners across the region uh, to pilot seed technologies that can help um, increase establishment rates uh, for those desired plants. And these efforts are, are holding promise in increasing return on investment for restoration dollars spent. And back to LCF applications, Nature Conservancy has been active in the Truckee River watershed for decades. And we tried to adapt our work there to uh, the conservation issue of the day. Uh, and a few years ago, we became very concerned that this beautiful watershed of ours that is just as important to the local economy as it is to fish and wildlife could go from this to this. Catastrophic wildfires like the one pictured in the image on the left leave denuded landscapes like the image in the middle. And those denuded landscapes, post-fire runoff from those denuded landscapes can contribute soil, uh, ash, and debris, and contaminate our waterways for years after fire events. Uh, these pictures are from the northern part of the Rio Grande watershed in New Mexico, uh, but we see examples just like this all across the western U.S. So as Louis already demonstrated, LCF is, um, is a flexible tool. It can be adapted to different landscapes, different vegetation communities. It can be used to address different conservation issues and answer different questions. And so we asked Louis and his team to build and link maps and models to look at the current condition of the vegetation in the Truckee River watershed, quantify current and future fire risk levels, and then couple those results with soil yield models. So the map on the left. Can you still hear me? Okay. <laughs> so the map on the left demonstrates where stand replacing fire risk is greatest in the Truckee River watershed. The hotter colors demonstrate the, the higher risk levels. And again, these are stand replacing fires. These are fires that can denude landscapes like we saw in the previous images. The figure in the middle demonstrates soil yield risk. So if this landscape were to burn, these darker colors show where soil yield would be highest on that burned landscape. And by overlaying these two images, these two data sets, and then applying some parameters such as um, slope and distance to waterways, we can prioritize restoration actions, the sites for restoration actions, to, re to best return, uh, to get the best return on our investment in terms of, you know, not only reducing standard placing fire risk, but also protecting our water resources at the same time. And it's these co-benefit types of projects that we try to target. Um, and that's another advantage of using conservation science in the development of, of restoration in the development of restoration efforts. Um, by using conservation science and, and targeting co-benefits, 
projects get, are generally better for the ecosystem because we take a more holistic view of that system and we um, you know use a, a a more effective approach to restoration actions and this is not only better for the landscape but it's also generally more attractive to stakeholders as well as funders who may represent diverse interest in the same general landscape. And just, you know, recapping some of these co-benefits that, you know, we can target in any given project, of course, you know, trying to reduce the wildfire frequency, uh, protecting water resources, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, improving wildlife habitat, and then improving range conditions, um, creating higher quality forage for both uh, livestock and wild herbivores. So again, to just recap the uh, key takeaway messages that we want to focus on here. Restoration increases ecosystem resistance to wildfire. Um, again, to a lesser but still meaningful degree, increases the landscape's resilience post wildfire. Field breaks are a very useful tool and they should only be considered as part of the solution as they perform much better when coupled with restoration actions. Fuels management of our forests and shrublands are a key element in watershed management and those actions can enhance water security for people and nature. And then finally, restoration and fuels management are natural climate solutions. Uh, again, uh, some of the co-benefits can be generated from these are water security enhancement and carbon storage enhancement. So with that, we'd like to thank you again, and um, we're happy to accept questions if you have them. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, are there any questions from the committee? Yes, Chair, I, have a, sure. I have a question. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ms. Peters. Uh, Thank you. Um, so this is really great and fascinating research. Um, my question though is how quickly do these predictions and um, priority projects become shovel ready? Um, like at what point, how much more planning effort goes into making this a project that we can do like at the drop of a hat? Louis, you, you want me to answer, that? Mickey? Yeah, okay. This is, for the record, this is Louis Provence. We had projects where um, we did the remote sensing, the modeling, and within a year or two, the BLM, the Forest Service, or the Park Service had done the NEPA work and had started obtaining funding and started uh, implementing actions. So sometimes it's pretty rapid. Uh, often the agencies, sometimes it's private industry too, approach us because they use the modeling results and the mapping we do in estimation of habitat quality to actually for NEPA justification. So they need this information to write the NEPA documents and then submit that, get the funding, uh, get the record of decision if that passes and maybe uh, hopefully survive litigation with their proposed actions and implement. And sometimes the turnaround, we had one project, the turnaround was so fast, it was less than a year and it was all less than a year after we submitted the modeling results and the reports that they were able to start seeding in the ground and doing actions. In other cases, it took more time uh, for various reasons. And it's often it's because the funding was not there or there was litigation. So it can happen pretty rapidly. Um, it depends on the district, the field office. So this pretty much develops the plans so that we can, that can be followed up with the NEPA document and the permitting requirements. Is that correct? That's, that's most often the case we had, yes. How, how long does it take typically take to run this type of model? So um, it takes, for us, it takes, we're pretty fast on the remote sensing. From the time we remote, start the remote sensing, we do the field work in July. By next May, we have the maps all done and we start the simulations before we get the maps. We prepare them and the simulations and all that. By September, we have pretty good results and by December, we have a final report. So we can do these projects in 
depends on the size of the project. Sometimes it may take two years. It's a, if it's a million acre landscape, we've done a million point five acres. If we do a smaller landscape, like 100,000 acres, uh, we can do that in a year and a half. And sometimes we've done one in a year really, really fast, but I don't like doing that. It's a little bit difficult to, uh, because we have other work we're doing too. So it's pretty, you know, within two years we have, the modeling is all done, the remote sensing's done, we got the report written. It, it, it changes with different projects, but we're pretty fast on that. Thank you. You're welcome. I believe Senator Brooks has a, a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, out in the work that you do on, on seeding and the fire breaks as well, but um, to protect our valuable um, rangeland and 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 uh, in the state, how closely do you work with uh, DCNR and and specifically in their um, carbon? Um, modeling and data collection on um, uh, on soil and and plant life, and that's the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. I'm sorry, I'm sure you know that, but <laughs> I hate using acronyms. Not sure who's going to be answering this one. Um, I recently have a project that we started with the state of Nevada through the heritage program to work actually on the carbon modeling as a follow-up from that Hawaii Upland project and restoration and estimating the how much carbon we could store in these degraded rangelands to restore basically to restore them to perennial vegetation. So that I started doing that. Most often I've worked with um, BLM, Forest Service, Park Service, Department of Defense, the mining industry. Um, so these are typically, and NRCS, we worked with NRCS on several projects. So this is where, that's my experience right there with those groups. But like I said, we just got a project funded by the US Climate Alliance that goes through um, the Nevada Division of Natural Heritage. And that's literally just started the project. So that's the extent of my experience with the, uh, the state of Nevada so far. And, and Madam Chair, um, this is uh, John Ravy with uh, Bureau of Land Management. And uh, may I add uh, points in here if that's okay? Yep, please do. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so to, uh, to to answer the question regarding coordination, um, uh, this uh, this past year in the, in, uh, in November, there was a, a shared stewardship agreement that was signed uh, by the um, uh, uh, by the governor. Um, and uh, the Forest Service, uh, BLM, and the Fish and Wildlife Service um, to focus on coordination of our efforts uh, regarding uh, landscape level uh, uh, fuels treatments that would um, address uh, some of these issues. And so I know that team has been meeting on a regular basis to identify those priority landscapes and to, uh, and to move that path forward. And, and, and absolutely, uh, DCNR and, and uh, uh, Nevada Department of Forestry is uh, absolutely integral to that uh, effort. So I wanted to point that out. And then um, I also just wanted to mention quickly that uh, regarding a comment that was made uh, about how much time does it take to basically go through the NEPA process and authorize these types of projects. And, um, and I just want to mention that uh, in March uh, that the Secretary of Interior did sign the record of decision for a programmatic um, environmental impact statement that uh, analyzes the construction of over 11,000 miles of these fuel breaks across the uh, sagebrush uh, ecosystem in um, Idaho, Nevada, California, and Oregon, and Washington. And we also uh, here in Nevada are implementing our the first um, uh, project, pilot project out of that. It's a, it's a four mile fuel break in our Elko district. And so what that allows us to do, that programmatic environmental impact statement allows us to rapidly um, uh, develop project level um, uh, evaluations and decisions um, to move these types of projects forward quickly. And I just wanna say this work by the Nature Conservancy is just fantastic. They do an awesome job. They always have, um, and I uh, just really appreciate their work. They do amazing work. Thank you. Mr. May I follow up, Madam Chair? You may. Oh, and, I, and I want to thank Mr. Raby for, for prioritizing some of these, these incredibly important projects that preserve our public lands, both for all Nevadans to use, especially, you know, the, the ranching community in, in, up, up in central and northern Nevada. And also, would like to thank the Nature Conservancy and, and for working so closely with DCNR in this current 
um, uh, grant opportunity that we have to to kind of look at where um, carbon uh, sequestration in, in our, our plant and soil life and is is uh, also helpful to all the, the users of the land. And I just wish that that we all would have voted to accept that that grant because um, it's so important to this this work. So thank you so much uh, for, for presenting today and for all the hard work you're doing to protect that land for all of us. Thank you. Any other committee members have questions? I have a couple, but I'll let the committee go first. Senator Gokichia. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> and I agree, it's, uh, it's very good data. Unfortunately, it's all about the dollar. And uh, the bottom line is it's a lot cheaper. And I, I just your comments on this uh, to the to folks from Nation Mickey and, and group. Uh, it's cheaper to put in fuel breaks than it is, you know, these go in and rehab these huge land landscapes uh, again with perennial seed uh, or reseed in, into perennial plants. So, uh, you know, it, it just I guess are we better served with focusing first and foremost on the fuel breaks and uh, and the ability to stop those fires rather than trying to go out and treat a million acres. The dollars are what gets us. Thank you, Senator. Um, so I, I have um, Assemblywoman Titus is actually in her car driving and she has sent me a couple questions that I agreed I would, I would ask on her behalf. Um, so um, she has sent me a question, um, is other with the simulations that you presented, do you have any comparisons that you have of, uh, to actual events where these um, have been implemented that we could, do you have any visuals for that? I think that was one question. And um, then I think she had a question about um, that it takes a while to do the modeling and what are the barriers to start seeding and road clearing immediately? I can answer, this is Louis Provence, for the record, this is Louis Provence. Uh, visuals for the LCS project we have uh, the visuals we have are what the agencies, the, photo, uh, the agencies who have implemented the project, the documentation photos of the restoration projects that we recommended. And this has happened both in Utah and Nevada, some in um, California, so uh, Eastern California. So we would get those photos from the agencies that implement the project. Since we work on public lands, the Nature Conservancy is not implementing those. It's the the agencies are doing it, but um, and some is so we can actually obtain some of those photos of projects that's been done. Um, for the rest of the question, though, I'm going to have to pass it on to probably Liz Munn, which I notice is muted now, is on the thing, so she probably can um, for the barriers part and all that. She's probably the best person to answer that question. And I'll mute myself. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, this is uh, Liz Munn, for the record, from the Nature Conservancy. Thanks, Louie. Um, I, I think the barriers that were, or, or what we would emphasize is the use of um, really strategically placing those fuel brakes. Um, so it's, it's a, a, a little bit of extra lift to make sure that we, we put those fuel brakes in the right place. But we want to make sure that because there is a cost, both financially just to do them and and two, there is there can be a cost to maintain those fuel breaks, which we know is really important to their effectiveness. We want to make sure that we're strategic about putting those in place. So, uh, as Director Raby pointed out, there is a programmatic uh, envir environmental impact statement that allows for a lot of fuel break activities to be rapidly deployed. We would suggest that some additional planning um, is is important, and as I'm sure. Director Raby would agree to make sure that we get those again in the right place. So if you think about the slide that we showed uh, with that connectivity model where we, there's all the, the red um, uh, that was sort of stopped by that fire. When you think about that, you know, what that model, what that slide tells us is, you know, if we had shifted that fuel break 10 miles to the Southeast or 10 miles to the Northeast, it wouldn't be as effective as if we located it right where it was. So we think that these models are useful for, again, very strategically putting those fuel brakes so that we're not um, 
needlessly creating uh, um, fuel breaks where we were going to have to maintain them at great cost uh, for a long time. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I had one last question about um, the modeling, because uh, you talked about um, this are, these are just these are cheatgrass dominated areas. So I'm wondering, do you have models of how fire breaks? I mean, how is there are there any models that show how we can start to get back from um, cheatgrass monoculture areas? I, I know that, that yes, that's this is the biggest issue. So. Um, yeah, is there a way we can get back, get those back? Louis Provence, for the record. Uh, yes, actually, when we do these simulations, um, especially with the, um, the federal agencies and also with the mining industry, um, we test many actions, not just cheatgrass, but one of them, uh, we've actually different over large geography because of the preference of different field offices and ranger districts. It, using different methodologies to treat these cheatgrass areas. We've actually tested, uh, we've actually simulated different types of restoration of these areas, some with pure native species and others with uh, introduced species mixed with native species and some with planting sagebrush and uh, plugs of seedlings of sagebrush and some not. So um, we've explored actually many things, uh, not just this one, but this is actually in many of the cases for of the more difficult actions uh, above a certain elevation converting those cheatgrass dominant areas to something that's either more native or something that has perennial grass and may have introduced species in it like crested wheatgrass and mixed it with natives and sagebrush in it that's actually less difficult to do because in the west people have a lot of experience it's really the lowest elevations that are the difficult parts. So, um, but with these models, they're flex. As Mickey mentioned, they're very flexible models, and whatever the customer wants, we will try to do it. And we incorporate the success and failure rate of actions into our simulation. If uh, seeding fails, sixty uh, is successful sixty to seventy percent of the time. That's what we put in the model. You still pay for the hundred percent because we attach a budget to these simulations. So you you pay for your failures too. And so, but it's what the customer wants or the agency or, and we, we simulate that and try to achieve conservation benefits of various sorts. So we, I hope that answers your question. It does, thank you. Um, are there any further questions from the committee? Uh, Senator Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Go yes. ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just to, this is more to, to John Raby. Uh, does it always require an EIS, or can we, especially coming out of a fire, can we not get by with a with an EA? And it, you know, in some of these cases, especially coming out of a fire, and if we want to get get on the ground quickly, do we? Does it always require an EIS, John? So again, uh, thanks for the question, uh, John Ravi, uh, Bureau of Land Management, for the record. And um, uh, it, it does not, um, Senator Gokchia, it, it does not always require an EIS. And in fact, um, when we do our burned area uh, emergency response plans. Um, those are done in a very rapid environmental assessment and site assessment by a, by a strike team that comes in and, and puts that together. And then we have a burned area rehabilitation um, uh, plans that those typically are the uh, actions that are implemented two to five years after a, a fire has burned. And um, the emergency response is to, to deal with the very first year's um, uh, needs. And we do, um, uh, many times we'll do, uh, we can do an EA uh, environmental assessment to um, implement those actions um, when we don't have, um, again, complexity or, or some situation that would cause us to go to an EIS. So we absolutely can do, uh, do an e, uh, environmental assessment and not do an EIS. Thanks, John. And so in that scenario, and I'm just trying to paint the picture, uh, clearly if we're coming out of a fire and uh, again with the data that's provided by Louie and Mickey here, we can, we can see, okay, it does, it would be beneficial to really move forward and seed this particular area or reinforce and, and rehab this particular fuel break, uh, you know, I think it's so much, it, it's critical and then we don't have to deal through this long EIS process and because, and then the other scenario is the native versus non-native seed, you know, most of us out here in northern Nevada would prefer at least a mix because we have better success and I don't think anybody disagrees with that. Did you guys look at that, Mickey and, uh, uh, and Louie, as far as 
you know, as you're doing this data and, and the comparisons, you know, the success rate on rehab versus uh, native versus non-native? So I'm going to take this from Louie. <laughs> Um, so again, Liz Munn for the record, um, and as we've pointed out, we, we do a, a variety of treatments um, that we've modeled, and, and we recognize the challenge of using native seeds, particularly in uh, low elevation conditions, low precip zones. And so we typically model using introduce, introduced species such as crested wheatgrass, Siberian wheatgrass, uh, forage kochia in those areas. We also uh, model a lot of our fuel breaks we consider to be uh, green strips of crested wheatgrass because they are, you know, lower cost to maintain over the long term. So we, we, we recognize that, especially at lower elevations, that's probably the most cost effective tool that we have right now. Um, one of the things that you point out in the last discussion that I um, is this idea of using these kinds of models as a, as a, um, pre-planning activity for the eventuality that we are going to have fire. And it's something that CNC is exploring right now with our, with the, um, uh, potentially with the BLM. We've put in a proposal to do some work like this where we could do some modeling for restoration activities in advance so that those fair teams, those burned area response teams, have some tools at their disposal to make really good decisions about where to use introduced species versus native species when they're trying to make really difficult decisions in a short amount of time with a limited amount of information. So trying to give them some more tools uh, under that circumstance so that, again, we can take advantage of that situation and, and get the best restoration decisions out on the ground. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any further questions? All right. Um, and I will also note that um, the money that came through through the SB 508 um, allocation for um, wildfire planning really has been um, um, a way to assist these multi-agency um, partnerships to try to get some of this work done, right? And we just, at the last um, interim finance committee, uh, got approval to release the remaining um, $4.75 million for that. Um, so that money will be going to good good use for um, planning going forward and, and um, fuels reductions. Um, so if there are no further questions at this point, I want to thank everyone from the Nature Conservancy for being here. We appreciate it. Always good to see you. And um, thank you so much for your presentation and all of your excellent work. And with that, we'll, we'll move on to our next agenda item, which is agenda item five. Uh, this is a presentation of wildfires and mining in Nevada. And I believe we have uh, Mr. Gray with us, who's the president of the Nevada Mining Association. Uh, we also have Joseph Reine, who's the director of workforce engagement with uh, NMA, and Rich Mayer, who's the regional safety and fleet manager for state fire. So, uh, gentlemen, however you would like to proceed, and welcome to the committee. Good morning, Madam Chair and Chair members of this committee, uh, Tyree Gray here, president of the Nevada Mining Association. And uh, frankly, I have to get used to saying that. This is actually my first presentation. So this uh, committee will always be endeared to me as being the very first time that on the record I've been able to share that. Um, first and foremost, I would like to say hello to my friends from TNC. Um, we actually have them scheduled to present at our board meeting uh, next week. And we've been able to have and establish a wonderful relationship with the Nature Conservancy, so I do definitely appreciate the work that they've been doing. Um, as you all know, the Nevada Mining Association is a members-based um, association with roughly 525 members, and the entire mission of, of the association is to unite, educate, and advocate um, to serve as the voice of the modern mining community. And today what we're going to do is kind of just walk you through um, kind of a very high level um, introduction of what the mining industry has been up to in regards to being able to, res to respond and plan for what is inevitable, unfortunately, 
which is the uh, possibility for wildfires. So with that, I'm going to have Joseph take it away and also um, he will kind of guide you through the presentation and then myself and Rich will be here and available for questions that the committee may have uh, later on um, after the presentation is over. So with that, Joe, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Tyree. Joe Riney for the record. So I wanted to start first with some of the risks that uh, there are that pose to the surface mines. Of course, some of those risks will obviously be the health and safety of miners, but one of the critical pieces is the electrical infrastructure. Uh, that is an important piece that it always needs to be protected. Equipment and property damage, uh, the interruption of operations due to, to fires. Uh, and then of course, there's the environmental impacts. So fires threaten valuable wildlife habitat, uh, especially for mule deer, sage grouse, and golden eagles. Mining operations expend a lot of money and effort to mitigate uh, impacts to wildlife. So those fires present a real threat to those efforts. Uh, additionally, wildfires can pose a threat to operations undergoing closure and in post-closure, vegetative covers are critical to water management and closed components at mines, such as tailing impoundments, waste rock piles, and leach pads. Wildfires can also impact critical infrastructure for post-mining land uses. Uh, mining operations are evaluating options for renewable energy generation after mining has ceased. The viability of such conversions is, such, is, is much less economical uh, if the power lines, the transformers, and the uh, electrical infrastructure is destroyed or damaged. Uh, and then infrastructure damage from wildfires can also impact systems that are important to maintaining environmental controls, uh, such as pumps, pipelines, alarm systems, liners, uh, things of that nature. And then one issue that uh, that's come up in recent years is dipping from impoundments. And so when, when firefighting efforts are underway, they will dip from various ponds that are available to various water sources. Um, and it has happened in the past where uh, the wrong pond was chosen for a dipping location. Uh, we've since worked on that, so it seems unlikely that that would happen again, but that is definitely a risk. Some of the risks that you'll see for underground mines are, are largely the same as with surface. However, there are two major uh, differences. The first being ventilation systems. So ventilation systems obviously are bringing in air to the underground mines. And so if there's smoke in the air, you'll have uh, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and that could get pumped down into the underground mines, which would uh, very quickly, pretty much instantly become uh, an urgent issue uh, requiring the uh, emergency escape of miners. Um, so they will have uh, N95 self or W65 self-rescuers which they'll don those and, and work to exit the mine. Um, but along with that, if there's electrical damage and there's issues with hoists or powering those devices, it could be problematic getting them out of the mine at time. So uh, those two really lie together. Uh, and then of course, there's the interruption of operations, but ventilation and electrical are the primary risks when it comes to uh, the underground mines. So this is a, a map that we've had uh, put together with uh, the Nevada Division of Minerals. And what this is, is this is the fire danger, wildfire risk index map. And overlaid with that, we've got uh, the, the major mines of Nevada. So it's not every single mine in Nevada as there's a little over 200 total, but this is all the, uh, all the major ones with you know 10 or more employees. Um, and so they're spread pretty, pretty uh, randomly throughout the state. We did provide this as well, so you should have a handout that you can print and, and get a better view. But we do have a close-up view of Northern Nevada. So this is the enhanced view for Northern Nevada. As you can see, there, there are a few mines that are in uh, high-risk areas. Uh, and so in this model here, the blue triangles will be metal, gold, silver, copper mines. The uh, gray ones will be industrial minerals such as lithium, uh, barite, things of that nature. And then aggregates are the black ones. And then uh, specimen minerals are the gemstone mines. We've got a couple of those throughout the state. This is a close up view of Southern Nevada. And so as you can see, they're, they're pretty well spread there as well. Um, much less risk areas, but uh, there's definitely some mines in some critical areas. Next up, we wanted to discuss some of the mitigation efforts that mines go through. Um, so obviously PPE would be a major piece of, of 
protecting employees. Uh, and some of the PPE used is firefighting helmets, goggles, shields, uh, fire rated shirts, pants, uh, and sometimes a, a coverall instead of a, a shirt or a pants, leather gloves, fire shelters. And then with that, we would need to train all the miners who are gonna be involved in firefighting rescues, all the emergency response crews. So any personnel engaged in the suppression of wildfires will have the minimum training uh, and demonstrate the following, which would be fire line safety, use uh, uh, and limitation on protective equipment, fire shelter use, basic wildland fire behavior, fire suppression techniques, and then basic wildland, wildland fire tactics, and then of course, first aid and all miners on, on a mine site are trained in first aid uh, as a base criteria to be a miner. Then of course, they've got their annual refresher trainer training, which is, uh, you know, they'll meet the progress with for file fire, firefighter training and they shall attend annual wildland, wildland firefighter refresher trainings and properly demonstrate the usage of all equipment, tools and personal corrective equipment, as well as uh, fire shelter use. Uh, one big tool that we've had uh, really that's, that's come a long ways with the uh, mitigation efforts has been the annual BLM meeting. So we have a state preseason preparedness meeting that happens between the mining industry and BLM. And this annual meeting has uh, worked well for communication and making sure that everyone's on the same page on how things should proceed during the fire season. Uh, lots of issues have been worked out in the past with these meetings. Uh, this is how we were able to overcome the dipping issue that occurred in the past. We've uh, discussed communication issues and how to modify communication to uh, improve response. And then, so one of the final tools that a mine will use to protect the, uh, the, the property would be uh, defensible space. And so mines will prepare a safe area around the mine perimeter known as a defensible space. And then during wildfire conditions, the space is utilized to act as a barrier between approaching fire and infrastructure that needs to be defended. Uh, and this can be done with heavy equipment, hand tools, or through controlled burns. And in the picture below, you will see uh, an example of a controlled burn at one of the mine sites. So the teams are working on clearing some of that, uh, that fire fuel uh, and so creating a, a defendable area. Last, I wanted to discuss some of the success stories that have uh, came out of uh, recent years. And so first would be the support for the BLM uh, annual preseason meetings. These meetings have, have consistently proven to be a benefit for the industry. Uh, we've been doing them for, I believe this will be coming up on the third year. Uh, and it's definitely helped to iron out those communication issues as well as uh, increase the cohesion in firefighting efforts. Uh, we have been working on sharing fire danger information. And so that's a network of if there's a fire, it's coming in this direction. And that way we're able to better respond and uh, get those minds that are able to respond to respond as needed. Um, and a great example of that would be the, the Cortez mine. Uh, and I do believe Rich Meyer uh, was involved in this uh, specific situation where uh, a 700 acre copper fire from 2018 was fully suppressed by Barrett Cortez. The, the fire occurred when BLM had multiple unstaffed fires and then mutual benefits were realized from the BLM with suppression of costs and resource damage and Barrick by protecting the critical mine infrastructure and keeping the mine open and operating. So some of the training would be uh, from the BLM is uh, over 150 mine employees have been trained uh, and wildland fire dozer use through uh, memorandum of uh, understandings over the past two years. Uh, a copy of those MOU, uh, MOU document is included in your packet as well. And then geospatial mine data. So the industry has been working with the BLM to identify potential water sources that can be used for dipping during fire control situations. <clears throat> there is also a significant risk if the dipping occurring from an impoundment that may have contaminants, chemicals, or even fuel that could uh, help fuel the fire. So uh, we continue those discussions uh, and we're also discussing on increasing more mapping into the BLM collector app that will identify power lines, power infrastructure, and high value targets. Uh, really those, those critical infrastructure pieces that we are looking to uh, really defend that are important, such as the uh, power infrastructure that would lead to an underground mine. And with that, um, I think we're ready for, uh, for questions. I would just add one thing um, to Joe's presentation, uh, just as a reminder that we have members and operators who will be as small as 10 employees um, and as large as thousands of employees. So 
some of our operators are trained and have the ability to actually be able to respond to these wildfires on their own. Um, however, there are others who just like a regular citizens and a regular business uh, businesses, uh, their only resource is to actually pick up the phone and, and call for help. So we do have a wide variety of responses um, depending on what the resources of that mine are. And so, I mean, that's just something to keep in, uh, keep in mind. Thank you, thank you for that. So are there any questions from the committee? Uh, Senator Gokichia, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Tyree must have read my mind. Uh, I guess, you know, over the years as we've dealt with th this issue, uh, and uh, as I looked at your notes, you're saying you've got approximately 150 personnel that are uh, certified, uh, actually red carded, so they could go out on a fire. Uh, and I guess that depends on how many on our shift. I think if there's kind of a hole in the program that, that we, I would like to see personally across northern Nevada is, is the ability of the mining industry to respond. In many cases, they do have equipment, i.e. large motor graders or, and, and or water trucks that could respond. And in many cases, they really don't respond until it's actually a threat to their facility or i.e. Their, their power lines or infrastructure. So, you know, I was just hoping as we work towards this, they definitely have the equipment, they have the personnel, if we could kind of focus on additional training there and additional certification and additional protection from the mining industry. Sorry, Tyree. <laughs> No, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, this is Tyree, for the record, Tyree Gray, Nevada Mining Association, uh, through the chair to Senator Goyka Chia. Um, I think that that's really the purpose of the BLM meetings that we're seeing and then our ability to continue to strengthen our relationship um, within the communities. Again, sometimes getting a piece of equipment from the mine site actually to where a fire um, is, is actually brewing is, is, a, is a difficulty within itself. Um, again, recognizing the size of some of those equipments, but I believe that we're working on creating some of those mutual aid agreements. And again, with the establishment of some of uh, our smaller members actually turning into joint ventures and things like that, I believe that the ability to have asset sharing is something that we'll see in the future. Uh, Joe, did you have anything to add? Joe Riney, for the record, yeah, I just wanted to stress that there are many mutual aid agreements out there where uh, mines do come to the aid of counties, cities, and things of like that. But as Tyree mentioned, it is definitely an issue to get a piece of equipment. Um, if you're talking about a D12 dozer, it's it's a very large piece of equipment. Um, and moving it is a, is, is a huge challenge in and of itself. And just tramming that vehicle directly to the site, um, they only move at uh, I want to say probably 10 to 15 miles per hour. So getting it from point A to point B can be very, very challenging. Um, so there's definitely that, but there's always room for improvement as well. Uh, Rich, do you have anything to add? Yeah, this is Rich Meyer for the record with State Fire. Um, uh, so yeah, I was directly involved with a few of these. Um, uh, Senator Gokachia, actually, most of the fires that we responded to when I was the Chief of Emergency Response at Cortez were not actually threatening our property. We were actually responding to uh, help our surrounding communities limit, with limited resources. So, um, but that was what was important about the MOU agreement that we drafted with the BLM and uh, developing that relationship with Brock Ulig and some of the a a FMOs around the site so that they trusted us, they trained us, and then they knew that we could go take care of the problem. So they would actually, we'd be working under them so that we would release our liability and then we'd go help out the surrounding community. So that's that's our main issue for the mining community is is the liability. You don't want to tram a D D10 dozer right through cultural resources with, you know, with, with if the DOM's not there to tell you to actually cut a fire line. So we would respond and, and help out as much as we could under their direction. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I'll go back to a fire that was at Ball Mountain. Uh, we were there fighting. It was very close to mine property. And I'll never forget, they, they put a D9 in one of those hall packs. And, of course, they put a scoop of dirt in there, drove the cat in. When it came off the hill, I thought, where in the hell did they get that six? But when he dumped it, it was a nine. So uh, they move them a lot faster than us cowboys can. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. So I have a couple of questions that I have. Um, 
One is that I, you, you talked about coordinating with the BLM, which is the you know immediate partner, definitely. I'm wondering if you talk a little bit about, um, I know that NDF and the Forest Service and BLM have all been talking together. Um, how much has, has um, mining been talking with those other organizations just because it's becoming a bigger kind of co um, coordinated, coordinated effort in Nevada? I'm going to defer to Rich on that. So we, we uh, Rich Meyer for the record, but we, we would, uh, we can, we coordinated with everybody. I, we, I don't know if you knew, I, I work for a large mining company. So we, we had actually EMS, fire, structural fire, wildland fire, uh, wild, uh, hazmat response. So uh, we, it was our effort the last five years to really get community engagement and that and get out in the community and let them know that we, what we could do as an emergency response team um, so yeah, we we work with a lot of those community outreach programs to to just get out there and let them know that we could help them. And at, actually, just during my tenure at at that larger mine, we we responded to multiple things that weren't just wildland fire. We would actually go out for hazmat response and 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 things of that nature as well. So um, it's been a high priority of the emergency response department and those big bigger mining companies to actually get out in the community and and let them know that we're, we're there to help and we're another resource. So have you been working with the division of the Nevada Division of, of Forestry then? Yeah, I would, uh, I would pick uh, up what Rich said um, just briefly and say that through our environmental committee, through the association, um, we invite not only the environmental experts from the different mines in, but we also invite all the regulators in. And so we're at least on a quarterly basis having these conversations and being able to identify and and frankly speak about environmental issues, um, wildfires being one of those, and our ability to work with our regulators um, again to tackle a lot of these uh, these situations. So I'll let Rich kind of fill in the holes there, but we are actively engaged um, at a very minimum at a quarterly basis, if usually not on a um, every. Uh, on a monthly basis with our regulators and the independent divisions and departments in order to help and figure out ways to continue to protect the environment also and carry out um, our operations safely. Um, and just to answer your question, I, I didn't specifically um, cooperate with the Nevada Division of Forestry while I was there, it's been a, it's been a few years now. Um, I can't speak to what they're doing at this point. Um, mainly, we worked with the BLM because we were operating in a in a BLM in, in environment on land, um, and our local EMS and fire uh, companies around us. So, for me, it was mainly Eureka County. I worked a lot with the Eureka County EMS department and um, the Eureka County volunteer firefighters and, and the and the BLM. So that's who I partnered with mostly. Thank you for that. And I do think that um, reaching out to our local partners is really important. I think over the time that I've been working on wildfire issues, that's been a, a bit of a weak point that we see state and federal having great conversations. Um, but um, we need to do a little bit more outreach to the locals. Um, I would say that it's probably a good idea to kind of get in touch with and, and link up with the Nevada Division of Forestry. There was a study that came out by the Forest Service, I think it was last fall, um, suggesting like this uh, a shared stewardship that's run through the state. Um, and so we've been kind of having those conversations of having that state office as being kind of the focus of, um, of efforts and moving toward that in the future. So I would encourage that. Um, my other question is you talked about the 150 people, I wonder if you can talk, that, that are trained to work on um, fighting fires. How are those folks distributed? I'm guessing it's kind of intuitive, but if you just talk a little bit about that distribution, that would be helpful. Um, I'll I'll take this one, Joe. But um, so so how I did it is it was it was my responsibility as staff. We run more on like a volunteer basis. So most of our emergency response personnel were actually hourly workforce. Um, so they'd actually be on shift. Um, it was my goal, and it was written in our emergency response plan that we would have 10% of the workforce at any time. Uh, be be part of the emergency response team, and we had every modality of rescue that they would have to be trained in. So, if you're looking at a larger operation, we're at any one point in time, uh, we would have you know 50 people on a surface operation. 
I would have five and then probably another six in the underground. So uh, I had about, at, when I left, about 18 per shift at, at Cortez alone. And then at Gold Strike, it was about the same. So 15 to 16. Um, and that's another stride we, we, we used, and we used our underground, and we started training them. So we got larger groups of people that could respond at any given time. So to answer your question, about 10% of your operation is, it should be the goal of the mine site. And, it, and that wouldn't matter on the location, because we know that some of our some of mines are not in um, areas that have a lot of fires, but some are in, as that map showed, that some of our mines are in, in really high um, um, burn areas, high frequency burn areas. Um, do we see that we that you kind of shift where you have you make sure you make that quota there, but other places it may not it may not be necessary to have that many people with that skill. Um, so we based all of our decisions off of a hazard analysis that we did a high level hazard analysis. So um, specifically at the Cortez site, uh, wildland was our number one number one hazard that we felt that was going to impact our site. Um, so there was obviously more emphasis put on training our wildland firefighters. Um, we trained wildland fire three to four times a year, and we were always going out to assist the BLM. Um, Gold Strike as well, they, they had it up, uh, they're number one as well, so wildland fire there. But, for example, if, you, if you're looking at a you know a specific underground mine that's, in you know, just has a small footprint and it's not really, uh, you know, in a hard, hard fire zone, they're probably going to focus more on, you know, underground rescue and making sure that they get their their packs trained and they get that. So it just depends on the mine site, and you're exactly right. It depends on who, where you're at in your geograph geographic location if you're going to specifically focus on fire. Joe Riney, for the record, yeah, just to add to what Rich said, is if the mine is uh, right next to town, chances are they're going to have very few people who are wildfire trained and ready to go. But uh, the further out you get, you will definitely have a considerable amount. So if you're looking at Twin Creeks, uh, a mine that's you know a good hour away from town, they're going to have plenty of emergency response folks there, people trained. But uh, if you're looking at like a Robinson mine, which is located just five miles uh, outside of Ely, uh, they'll have much less. And of course, it again, it, as Tyree had mentioned, it, it really ties in on the size of the mine. So. If you're a small mine operator with uh, 19 employees, you, you're going to have folks that are first aid trained. You're going to have first responders on your mine site, but it's unlikely that you'll have uh, people trained in wild firefighting. Thank you. That'll make sense. Um, I have I have one last question, and I can't remember who brought this up, but someone mentioned you know you don't you don't want to take a dozer through a bunch of cultural resources. You need to wait until you hear from the BLM about where um, um, where that could be. And it's something like in these conversations about well, around wildfires that I've been thinking about is how to better have um, resources at everyone's fingertips. I know that we've often talked about. Um, I know we had this conversation during the legislative session when our working group got together that you'd kind of almost wait for, you know, you get some folks who came from, say, Minnesota who are helping out on a fire, and they have to go find a specific person. Like, they got to go find Joe to get some information. And so I'm trying to figure out ways in which these uh, the information that needs to be shared quickly can be done so without being contingent upon, say, waiting for... Joe to come along or an agency to come along. And I feel like if it's cultural resources mapping, and Mr. I, was say Mr. I see Mr. Raby popped up, so I thought he could help us out with this. So making things like those maps really easily accessible, at least to partners, so that so that if, if there's a fire that is threatening resources, that a given mine who has trained folks there doesn't have to wait for the BLM, but could head right out there because they've got those those maps. And so if you can talk to me a little bit about um, what is being shared and what's working and what do we still need to work on as far as um, information, information and kind of process sharing. Right. So um, so in, in any uh, fire, I mean, it goes through a, a number of stages. And so when we're talking about the um, the initial attack phase, that's when we first attack the fire and um, and and then do that initial response. Um, you know, many times that's uh, going to be um, uh, very uh, rapid um, in terms of the aircraft that are delivered to that site. And so it, it becomes a um, primarily aerial response to begin with. And then as engines 
uh, roll out to the scene and they're sizing up the fires or getting a, an attack strategy together. And when we're talking about then heavy equipment and dozers, um, those dozers um, typically are going to be used as more indirect line. And so um, there is a bit of time. Again, there's the immediate initial response. There's going to be the, the, the sizing up and then the planning for how to uh, the strategies and tactics on a fire. And we're talking about the dozers coming in. It does take some time to mobilize those. And at the same time, we mobilize our uh, what we call our resource advisors. And, and those folks have with them all of the um, locations on whether it's uh, threatened endangered species or sensitive plants or archaeological or cultural resources sites. They have that information from our GIS system and, and um, it is available for them so that they can work with the operator of that piece of equipment to as they're constructing a line to identify where they would construct line and then be able to uh, uh, construct that effectively. Now, you know, there are always perceptions about um, the time frame it takes to respond. Um, there's the perceptions about um, uh, whether somebody was uh, readily available to get a hold of. You know, my experience has been that 95% of the time, um, those things are easily remedied with, um, again, uh, making that call tree contact to the next available person and uh, and working it through that um, to, to make sure that happens. Um, our, our, our information, our geological or uh, geographic information uh, system does have uh, all of those sites uh, in them that we that we know of. Um, it's um, we we uh, do that make that available to um, folks in the wildland fire community and to, and to partners to, you know, again um, to the extent that we can provide that general location. Um, it's some information, quite frankly, is 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 sensitive and protected by 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 law, and so we have to be mindful of that. And um, and and sometimes that does take uh, some some working through in in rare circumstances, but. But by and large, it's the exception and not the rule that, that things are delayed. Um, uh, ex well, there's any sort of inordinate delay um, when there's uh, you know not information available. I mean, that's been my experience overall. It, it, and it just again, we gotta we gotta keep in mind that um, as we're as we're working on these um, you know responses, that it has been. And I and I just do just want to thank. I'm gonna take a minute and just uh, really thank Tyree and, and Joe and Rich for their incredible efforts. Um, and the in individual mines efforts, um, as well as the, the Nevada Mining Association, for their work towards um, being a partner in a unified response uh, in wildland fire. We talked about a federal, state, a local, and, uh, and 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 county response, and and that local response um, again uh, is is significant aspect of of making sure we're effectively responding to wildland fires, and and, and the folks in the mining community do that incredibly well, and as well as the ranching community. And that's part of our rancher liaison program. And, and those folks live out there, they're out there on scene, and, and many times they're the first to respond. Just want to thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Raby. Mr. Riney, did you want to chime in? Yes, Joe Riney, for the record, I just wanted to say that also with, with the communication in the BLM meetings, uh, there has been improvements along the way for response. So one of the things now that you'll see is if there's a fire near a mine site or even has the potential to come near that mine site, typically you will have someone from that mine site's emergency response team in the incident command center now. So they are part of the active uh, efforts that are under that are happening in incident command. So they're able to make those calls, communicate, move resources uh, much quicker. Thank you. Uh, Rich Meyer for the record, I, I'd like to just I've had real world application and, and really what we're what we're what we've found with the improvement of uh, the communication between us and the outside agencies of the mining and the outside agencies is, is one understanding the, the lingo exactly what he's talking about. We, we can get on scene quickly. Um, usually we roll like our type six or type three. Those are fire engines. We'll, we'll roll them out. We'll put water on the fire initially. Uh, we'll size up the scene. We'll get the weather information and any critical assets that are that are gonna be infringed upon. And we get that information quickly and, and concisely right to the BLM or whoever's gonna be responding so that they can make a better decision on, on how many resources that they need to send at that time. And I think that's the biggest success that we've seen so far is, is actually that open line of communication. At, at one point in time, Brock and I, just, he, he just called me. He had my cell phone number. so um, And we'd respond to even farther outside resources at that point. So um, it's a pretty successful relationship at this point. Thank you for that. Uh, any any further questions from the committee? More of a comment, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Senator, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, and I really appreciate it, Rich. But and it's all about initial attack and the ability of the mining company to to quickly 
uh, respond. Uh, of course, I'm very, I know Rock, Brock very well, and uh, I know your area there in Cortez in the Crescent Valley, but you talked about the 700 acre uh, copper fire in Crescent Valley. That's 30 minutes, uh, you know, in Crescent Valley with a little wind in that cheatgrass. It's all about initial response, and I really appreciate, you know, in most areas and, and the progress we're, we've made, you know, 10 years ago, it was not unusual not to get a response from a mine. And, and today we do see it. And uh, I think a lot of it is local fire departments reaching out. They do have fire plans and, and contingency plans in place. And I really appreciate what uh, what they're doing. Uh, it's just we can never have enough. And that's my comment. All right. Any Any further questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none, um, thank you so much, gentlemen, for, for being here today. And Mr. Gray, we are very um, honored to be your first committee uh, presentation in your new position. Congratulations. Um, so thank you so much, and um, have a, a safe holiday weekend. Um, so with that, we'll move on to agenda item six. This is our work session. Um, so. Um, you should have that document in front of you. It's also on the website, committee's website. Uh, just as a quick reminder, we do get five bills from this committee, but we can also have letters that we could send out. So there are some of those on the list. And I will also say that um, the work session document you see ahead of you is maybe not as bold as all of us would have liked to have been. Um, I think uh, at least Senator Gokichia and I had, had grand plans, but in light of um, the budget constraints that we're currently under, um, we, as we developed this list, we really tried to um, pull back any that had significant fiscal notes, uh, tried to really emphasize things that we could do in the 2021 session that um, had no fiscal notes so that we can make some progress on wildfires. Um, uh, in this legislative session, because we know that financially there won't be a lot of money this time around um, for programs. So while this may not be as exciting as we all had hoped, it will definitely um, get us in the right, moving in a, in a good direction. Um, so with that, Mr. Sinisbeck is going to walk us through um, each of these and the votes, and um, we will get a move on there. Thank you, Mr. Sinisbeck. Thank you, Chair Swank. Uh, for the record, I'm Jan Stinnesbeck with the Research Division of the LCB. As nonpartisan Senate staff, I can neither advocate for nor against any measure that comes before this committee. Uh, with that, I will probably provide a short overview of the work session process and the document in front of you. Um, the, the work session document is designed to assist the committee in determining what actions it wishes to take. Each item in this document may be subject to further discussion, refinement, or action. Uh, the items are not listed in provincial order, neither are their inclusion and expression of support uh, by the committee. And um, as the uh, Chair has already mentioned, in general, the committee can request uh, uh, to draft either bills or resolutions, send letters, or put a position statement in its final report. Uh, it is important to remember that the committee is limited by statute to five legislative measures, and uh, that any recommended legislation proposed by the committee must be approved by a majority of the members of the Senate and a majority of members of the Assembly. Um, with that short introduction, I'm ready to walk um, the committee through the work session document itself and through the recommendations, if you wish. Chair? Yes, please. Thank you. Recommendation A, the first recommendation in, in front of the committee today, is to draft a bill to codify in statute the Wildland Fire Protection Program the Nevada Network of Fire Adapted Communities and the Nevada Fire Board of Directors with Nevada's Division of Forestry. Additionally, the bill would create an incentive program under the Commissioner of Insurance to encourage insurance-related incentives for Nevada homeowners that become and maintain a fire adapted community status. The recommendation was made by NDF, and I believe we have Casey Casey, State Forest Fire Warden, with us today on the phone. Um, uh, to, to answer any questions that the committee might have. Um, as said, the, the recommendation was made by NDF, and uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Sinisbeck. Are there any, any questions on, um, on, this BD, on this proposed BDR?
Okay. Any? Madam Senator. Chair, I'll, a, a couple of quick questions. Uh, you know, I, and I guess it'll all depend on what the, the bill itself and, and and how much statutory change or how much is tied to it when we actually see it drafted. You know, it, right now it's it's pretty gray and pretty vague, and probably uh, intended to be so, just so we can kind of work with it as we as we move forward. Clearly, there's some benefits to expanding some of these programs, but again. Uh, when we get into the enforcement side and just exactly what is what's it going to mean and what's it look like? I think that's going to be huge Agreed agreed senator um, Any further questions or comments Okay, and um, and now I think I'm just having a brain blackout. Uh, this is what now we need to we vote on each one individually, correct, Mr. Sinisbeck? Sorry. Correct. Okay, so um, I think we could we could take a vote on this. So I would take a, a motion um, to include a um, the wildfire protection program um, as a, one of our BDRs for the next legislative session. Motion. I see a motion by Senator Brooks and a second. Second. Uh, do we need to have one from each house? Uh, Mr. Sinisbeck, do we need, need to have a motion from each house? Oh. You don't need a motion from each house, but the vote needs okay. to be at least two senators and at least two assembly members. And just to clarify, are you, you're taking the entire recommendation um, under this motion that would create the Wildland Fire Protection Program, the Nevada Network of Fire Adaptive Communities, uh, the Nevada Fire Board of Directors, and then the Insurance Incentive Program as one motion and one BDR. Yes, thank you for that clarification. Okay, so then we have, um, okay, just give me, give me 30 seconds to answer a question here to one of my members. And so I believe just we had a, a question from one of the members. Um, um, we have on this list five BDRs, five, five, only five options that qualify as a BDR. And just to make sure I'm remembering correctly. Uh, in total, the work session document proposes five BDRs. Um, the recommendation uh, that you're taking right now is recommendation A in the work session document, and all of those would be created in one BDR. So um, if the committee voted to approve this motion, then all of these would be created in one BDR, and then um, further down in the work session, we would be considering the approval of other BDRs. And there are only four additional BDRs that we're considering today in addition to this one. That's my understanding. Okay. I just wanted to be sure there was a there was a, a question from one of the members. Uh, and and I'll, and just to clarify for for our new members, a letter does not constitute a BDR, correct? Correct. Correct. Thank you. Okay. Any any um, any discuss any other discussion? I have a motion from Senator Brooks and a second from Senator Scheibel. Um, any further discussion? Senator Goykachia, I'm glad I'm not going to draft this, Heidi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it should be fun. Um, all right. So with that, uh, Mr. Sinisbeck, if you'll take the roll call vote. Thank you, Chair. Senator Brooks? Yes. Senator Goykachia? Yes. Senator Shail? Yes. Assemblyman Peters? Yes. Chair Swank? Yes. Assemblyman Titus? Yes, if you can hear me. We can hear you. Thank you. The motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Sinisbeck. Um, and then we'll move on to um, recommendation B. Thank you. Um, the next recommendations relate to wildfire prevention and fuels reduction. Um, the first recommendation under section B1 is to draft the bill 
to remove restrictions on the classification of noxious weeds. The bill would authorize the state quarantine officer to declare by regulation the weeds of a state that are noxious weeds, regardless of whether the weeds is, um, weed is already introduced and established in a state to such an extent as to make its control impractical in judgment of the state quarantine officer. This change would allow the state quarantine officer to classify cheatgrass as a noxious weed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so with that, I think let's, let's do a motion in a second and then we can have discussion. It's probably the best way to go. So is there a, a motion on um, recommendation B, um, removing restrictions on the classification of noxious weeds related to cheatgrass? I have a, a motion from Senator Brooks and a second from Assemblywoman Peters. Is there any discussion on the motion? Madam Chair, if you, uh, Senator Greg can see you here. I'm, I'm just kind of, I'm not really sure exactly what you're looking at, uh, removal of the restrictions. Uh, so you're saying then technically the restriction that uh, uh, cheatgrass is not to be is to be deemed a noxious weed. Is, it, is that the requirement of this BDR? It is currently under state statute. Um, it is in a, um, a piece of statute that I believe comes from about 1912 that actually disallows the movement, uh, the classification of cheatgrass as a noxious weed. Uh, the state quarantine officer currently cannot. Um, if they would so choose, classified as a noxious weed, this would merely allow them to if they chose to. It would not move, the, it would not change the classification. It would just remove that restriction. There's currently a restriction. It's not specifically for cheatgrass. It's for um, any um, invasive, I believe, and um, legal can probably help me out on this, but I believe it's from any invasive plant that is already established in the state of Nevada. Yes, and I'm fine with that. Um, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. So just to clarify, to under, under current sure. law, the state quarantine officer um, can declare by regulation weeds of the state that are noxious weeds. Um, there is a limitation on the authority of the state quarantine officer to do that um, if the weed uh, is already introduced and established in the state to such an extent as to make its control impracticable in the judgment of the state quarantine officer. It's my understanding that uh, the state quarantine officer has uh, not been able to uh, name sheetgrass as a noxious weed because of this language. So even though this language doesn't uh, prohibit um, grass from being designated as a noxious weed, we would be taking the language out under the proposed BDR so that if the state quarantine officer wanted to name sheet grass as a noxious weed, they could by regulation. Madam Chair. Go ahead, Ms. Lewin Titus. Um, I, thank you. Um, I just want to acknowledge that um, I think this is um, a great idea, and I am sure that Senator Hansen, who has spent hundreds of hours fighting cheatgrass verbally, will be very pleased with this particular BDR. So thank you. Thank you, Assemblywoman Titus. And I will say this, this um, as I believe Senator Gokichia may remember from the last session, I had been running around the building trying to find a bill that opened NRS 555 so I could amend this in, but to no avail. There was no place to put it last session. So um, this seemed like the best move forward. Any further discussion? Uh, then we'll go ahead, Mr. Stinnisbeck, with the roll call vote. Senator Brooks? Yes. Senator Gokachia? Yes. Senator Scheibel? Senator Scheibel? Assemblywoman Peters? Yes. Chair Swank? Yes. Assemblywoman Titus? Yes. 
Did we lose Senator Scheibel? I don't... Oh, there she is. Sorry, everybody froze, so I logged out. Logged in. Okay. Senator Scheibel? Uh, is this on the noxious weed BDR? Yes. Thank you, Chair. The motion passes. Thank you. Okay, so then with that, we'll move to recommendation C. The chair, I believe there's, uh, we, we're on recommendation B2. Oh, my apologies. Go ahead. So the next recommendation, B2, is to draft a letter to the um, Bureau of Land Management to encourage the consideration of land swap agreements uh, to reduce hazardous fuels. Uh, specifically, the letter would call for the reduction of hazardous fuels in the hard-to-reach uh, checkerboard landscape of public-private parcels in Northern Nevada. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Stinnisbeck. Um, so with that, um, I will take a a motion on um, basically uh, writing a letter to encourage some movement on dealing with our checkerboard lands here in Nevada. I'll take a motion. A uh, motion by Senator Gokachia and a second. Second. By Senator Scheibel. Okay, are there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, uh, Mr. Stinnisbeck, go ahead and take the roll call vote. Senator Brooks? Yes. Senator Gokachia? Yes. Senator Scheibel? Yes. Senator Peters? Yes. Chair Swank? Yes. Senator Titus? The chair, uh, chair, the, the uh, motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stinnisbeck. And um, I'll move us on to our next item then. Thank you, Chair. The next item before the committee is uh, C1. Um, and um, the next section of this work session document relates to wildfire management, specifically the first regulation on the section. Um, uh, C1 is to draft a letter of support uh, for the uh, DRI, the Desert Research Institute, uh, to study the potential use of unmanned aircraft systems for wildfire management. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sinisbeck. So with that, um, I will take a motion on item C1. Uh, by Senator Scheibel and a second by Assemblywoman Peters. Is there any discussion on the motion? Just a question, Madam Chair. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm not sure we're going to look look at it and study it. I understand by, but uh, you know, again, that's being more and more regulated and probably needs to be. If there's an issue on almost every wild on fire today, it's you know, warning the public not to fly, uh, you know, unmanned aerial vehicles around the site of the fire. So it, it's going to be sticky no matter what we do with it, but it needs to be addressed. Agreed. Agreed. Any further discussion on the motion? Okay, Mr. Stinnisbeck, go ahead and uh, take the roll call vote. Senator Brooks? Yes. Senator Okachia? Yes. Senator Ivel? Yes. Senator Peters? Yes. Chair Swank? My apologies, looking somewhere else. Um, yes. Assembly one Titus. The motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stinsbeck. So with that, we'll move on to item C2, um, uh, public-private partnerships and wildfire management. Thank you, Chair. 
Um, the next recommendation C2 is to draft a bill uh, authorizing public private partnerships for wildfire management, specifically to enhance investment in wildfire prevention, restoration infrastructure, and workforce development. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sinisbeck. So with that, I'll take a motion on item C2 from Assemblywoman Peters and a second from uh, Senator Gokichia. Is there any discussion on the motion? All right, then go ahead, Mr. Sinisbeck. We will um, take the roll call vote. Senator Brooks. Yes. Senator Gokichia. Yes. Senator Scheibel. Yes. Assemblyman Peters. Yes. Chair Swank. Yes. Senator Titus. Yes. The motion passes. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Sinisbeck. Um, we'll move on to item D, uh, relating to the recovery of costs of wildfires. Uh, the recommendation D is to draft a bill to authorize cities, counties, and general improvement districts to recover expenses incurred in uh, fighting wildfires. The bill also authorizes local government entities and the state forester uh, fire warden to recover attorney fees and costs uh, if they bring litigation to recover such expenses. The recommendation was made by the Nevada International Association of Arson Investigators and came through um, the solicitation recommendation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Stinnisbeck. So with that, um, I'll take a motion on item D. A motion from Assemblywoman Peters and a second from Senator Brooks. Is there any discussion on the motion? Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Senator. Uh, my only question is, who are we going to bill? So under current law, um, the state forester fire warden and uh, the fire protection districts created under Chapter 474 of NRS, um, they can uh, charge the expenses to a person, firm, association, or agency that is responsible for willfully or negligently causing uh, the wildfire. So um, I believe the recommendation would be to give the similar authority to the cities, counties, and GIDs. So it would be the a person, firm, association, or agency that is found responsible for willfully or negligently causing the fire. I don't mind saying, you know, uh, we can go ahead and have the discussion and bring the bill forward, but it does give me some real pause if we're going to have, uh, say, local governments, in fact, uh, you, Again, it, negligence is hard to prove, and uh, technically, we're coming right back to our our constituency to to you know find them at fault and uh, hit them with ten million dollar bills. If if you know, so I, I I'm a little nervous about that. That's why we have the NDF and these other agencies to kind of to buffer and get in the middle. So I I'm a little nervous about it, but I think it's worthy of the discussion. Thank you. Agreed, this is definitely a bit of a sticky wicket for sure, and it's going to require a lot of conversation, but I think it's something that um, is probably a good idea to move forward, at least to have the conversation. Any further discussion on the motion? Okay, Mr. Senesbeck, if you'll take the roll call vote. Senator Brooks? Yes. Senator Gokachia? Yes, if I can get unmuted here. Senator Scheibel? Yes. Assemblyman Peters? Yes. Chair Swank? Yes. Assemblyman Titus? Yes. Thank you, Chair. The motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Sinisbeck. So we'll move to. Uh, let's see, item E, the uh, wildfire mitigation plans of utilities. Uh, 
Recommendation E is to draft a letter to uh, Nevada and California utilities to encourage uh, current implementation to their uh, wildfire mitigation plans, especially as it relates to um, the Lake Tahoe Basin. And I believe we had uh, some uh, public comment on that today. Uh, the recommendation came from uh, Mr. Adler for the International Brotherhood of Electric Workers Local 1245 and uh, came out of the solicitation recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stennis. Uh, I'll take a motion on um, this recommendation. Is there a motion? Uh, this is Assemblywoman yes, Peters uh, and then uh, Senator Brooks, go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to move that we um, uh, adopt this. Okay, so I have a motion from Senator Brooks and a second from Assemblywoman Peters. Um, any discussion on this motion? Seeing none, uh, you can go ahead and take the roll call vote. Mr. Sinis back. Senator Brooks? Yes. Senator Kachia? Yes. Senator Tyrell? Yes. Assemblywoman Peters? Yes. Chair Swank? Yes. Assemblywoman Titus? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Sinisbeck. And we'll go to um, recommendation F on the Wildland Urban Interface Code. Recommendation F is to draft a letter to support the State Fire Marshal's Office in the statutory adoption of the most current version of the Wildland uh, Urban Interface Code. This recommendation is made by uh, NDF. Thank you. Thank you. I will take a motion on um, recommendation or on F, correct? Yeah, recommendation F. I'll take a motion. I have a motion from Assemblywoman Peters and a second. Second. From Sen Senator, Senator Scheibel. Um, any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, Mr. Sitt is back. Senator Brooks? Yes. Senator Gorgachia? Yes. Senator Scheibel? Yes. Assemblyman Peters? Yes. Chair Swank? Yes. Assemblyman Titus? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Stennis Beck. Uh, so moving on along, we will go to our last item, um, item G, uh, forest health and water quality. The last recommendation from the committee today is um, uh, a recommendation G, is to draft a resolution recognizing that forest health and water quality are inextricably linked. The resolution would express support for federal, state, and local governments to work with water purveyors and other stakeholders to identify watersheds that can be improved upon by better forest health measures. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sinisbeck. So I'll take a motion on item G from Assemblywoman Peters and a second from uh, Senator Goikachia. Um, any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, let's take the roll call vote. Senator Brooks? Yes. Senator Gorgachia? Yes. Senator Scheibel? Yes. Assemblyman Peters? Yes. Chair Spank? Yes. Assemblyman Titus? The motion passes. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Stinnisbeck. And I just lost my agenda. Hold on one second. I closed the wrong window on my computer, of course. Okay, there we are. I'm back. Sorry. Um, okay, so we have our our bills set and uh, resolutions and also letter uh, going forward. Um, so with that, uh, we will move into public comment. So as a reminder for folks who are listening, um, the phone number to call in is 669-900-6833.
and your meeting ID is 931-3257-2611. And so we're gonna take a short two minute break uh, just to allow folks to call in. My apologies, staff needs three minutes, so we'll be coming back in um, three minutes. My apologies. I think we have somebody on who is not muted. People want to, folks want to make sure that they've either muted on the phone or on their computers. Madam Chair, we're ready to proceed with public comment. All righty, thank you. So we'll come back um, and go to the first person in co public comment. Please remember to um, state and spell your name um, and comments will be limited to three minutes and staff will be timing each speaker and um, give you a 30 minute heads up when you're getting toward the end of your three minutes, a 30 second heads up, thank you. Caller with the last three digits of 8888, please state and spell your name for the record. You have three minutes. You are now unmuted and may begin. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, Tracy Bauer with the Desert Research Institute, T-R-A-C-Y-B-O-W-E-R. On behalf of our faculty, I'd just like to thank you for your willingness to draft a letter of support of DRI's wildfire research efforts. Uh, to explore ways to safely utilize drones and improve uh, fire response and firefighter safety. Uh, we appreciate the work of the committee and your uh, willingness to draft the letter of support. Thank you. Thank you. Caller with the last three digits of 249, please state and spell your name for the record. You have three minutes. You are now unmuted and may begin. This is Ernie Adler, E-R-N-I-E-A-D-L-E-R. I don't have any further comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Adler, for being here, and, and thank you for submitting um, um, your request for um, BDRs this, uh, to the committee. We appreciate it. Uh, do we have anyone else on public comment? That concludes public comment at this time, Madam Chair. 
Thank you, sir. So with that, I want to be sure to thank the committee. Um, we, um, it's been um, a, a, a short ride, but we've, I think we've gotten a lot done in our, in our four meetings, um, uh, even with only one of those being in person. Um, but thank you all so much for your hard work. And I also want to be sure to thank Senator Gokachia. We have been uh, doing this for a little while on this wildfire stuff, and hopefully we have gotten it to some place and uh, we'll keep going. Um, so with that, um, we have no further business. Thank you all so much for all of your time and efforts you put into this committee, and we are adjourned. Thank you all. Have a safe holiday weekend.